they have had a conference uh, 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 today. I would say I disagreed with, with quite a lot of things. Uh, by the way, I also agreed with, with some. For instance, I agree very much with uh, what uh, was said uh, just now uh, by Professor Espada. Um, but on the whole, I, I, I think it's quite clear that uh, it uh, has been a very lively conference, a very instructive conference, a very useful conference, because we had, uh, on some fundamental points, major disagreements. That's life, and we are happy about that. Now, interestingly, as I said, I agreed with most of uh, what was said by Professor Espada. Two small countries on the edge, quote unquote, of Europe, uh, and still uh, share a couple of points. By the way, when I was once uh, uh, in the BBC, and uh, I was introduced by the uh, uh, blonde lady, uh, it was a hard talk. Then she introduced me as the representative of a small country on the edge of Europe. Of course, Geza explained that we are Central Europeans, but never mind. So I didn't want to react. You know, you should never react in such a conversation. But I was just thinking after who is really on the edge of Europe here. But you draw the conclusions yourself. Now, uh, as I said, I try to be brief. Crisis, yes, crisis, multiple crises, no doubt. Overlapping crises, one after the other. Uh, one has not yet finished when the next one started. And, okay, we all know that. Uh, our favorite pastime, as I understand, uh, on both sides, on that there seems to be an agreement, is self-flagellation. We love it. Uh, this is also fancy. I mean, very much a la mode. So we have to um, be in the mainstream, as usually. We have to be as critical as possible. And certainly, we must not deny the enormous achievements of European construction in the last, uh, let's say, 60 or more years. Uh, but no doubt, the crisis is there. And we have serious challenges. Interestingly, some of the challenges, some of the major challenges, come from the outside. And we tend to forget it sometimes. Just three examples. Financial and economic crisis. Where did it come from? We all know it. Uh, second, of course, migration. Is it also coming from the outside? No doubt. Uh, then, uh, number three, terrorism. It's primarily coming from the outside. But, and that I uh, would like to add, each of these external challenges are compounded by our own internal weaknesses. So they are, in a way, internal as well. Uh, First, of course, uh, financial crisis, Euro. We all know that part of the problem, major part of the problem, was the weakness, uh, in a way, of, uh, of, of Euro, uh, absence of, uh, of, of, of a fiscal uh, uh, policy behind, uh, uh, economic policies, deficiencies, and so on. And also the high indebtedness rate uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of member states, uh, and after that, of course, uh, the whole problem turned into a sovereign uh, debt uh, problem. So that we also had our internal, let's say, contribution, in a way, uh, to, the, to, the, to the crisis. Migration, yes, of course, we had, we, we still have, I would say, our internal weakness. Uh, what about borders? What about Schengen border? What about defending our borders? What about uh, drawing conclusions from the basic fact that states have territory, and you can only have a territory if you have borders, and you can only have a state if you can defend your borders. Otherwise, forget about being a state, or you need a political entity, like European Union. Uh, and now we recognize it a little bit, much better than a year ago, and it takes time, I, 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 I realize, but still, it's now going ahead. Uh, 
Number three, terrorism. Yes, of course. There are internal elements. It would be a very long subject, so I don't want to get into that. But clearly, much of the terrorists, or many of the terrorist acts, they were committed by second or third generation people living in Europe. So there is a problem here. We all know that. That kind of uh, uh, multicultural model of society, or as we call it sometimes, parallel societies, it simply doesn't work. We have to do something about that. So we cannot say that this is only external. It is external and internal at the same time. So as it is said, this is now the combined effect of, of an external and an internal uh, factor. But to speed it up, we also have our own internal difficulties. Demography was referred to. To my mind, this is probably the most serious one. And dwindling and an aging population. That is number one. Of course, economy is stagnating or not, that's another subject. Uh, well, it is now moving a little bit. I don't want to make judgments on that because everything uh, depends upon the future. Uh, I'm quite satisfied, I would say more or less, about the economic performance of, of, of Central Europe. Again, just to make a little bit of distinction in our favor. Uh, it's not just my country, but it's in general Central Europe, or V4, if you prefer. Not just V4, look at Romania, for instance. They have probably one of the highest uh, growth rates uh, 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 this year. Uh, but that's a problem. We also have another internal challenge, that is the so-called value issue, which I don't want to get into. It's, uh, it's again, a very, 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 very long uh, subject. Uh, uh, but referring back, for instance, to, uh, to, 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 to migration or terrorism, uh, if we have no... Uh, clear uh, value background or basis, uh, how can we integrate people from the outside? You can't integrate, uh, you can't receive uh, without having your own self and identity. A vacuum uh, cannot integrate. You occupy a vacuum, but a vacuum will never be able to integrate people coming from the outside. Now, that's just a minor remark. Uh, we also have a, 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 an institutional uh, gridlock. I, I talked a lot about that last time we had the same conference, so I don't want to <laughs> repeat what I said, even if the audience is now different. But this institutional gridlock is serious. And this is, on the one hand, among uh, the union uh, institutions. Uh, I have my personal experiences on that. Uh, uh, at the time of the Hungarian presidency. It's not easy, but of course, at the same time, we have a gridlock between the member states and, uh, and, the, and the EU institutions. On the whole, I have a feeling, which uh, uh, remains to be confirmed, that uh, the original ingenious and enormously successful and inventive um, methods, like for instance, uh, the méthode communautaire, as invented by Jean Monnet, uh, seems to get exhausted. It has achieved a lot, but, you know, in politics, in history, in business sometimes, you have to have new ideas. Uh, and I think this is one of the basic uh, uh, challenge now, where to find and how to find uh, and how to implement uh, those uh, new uh, 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 ideas. So, there is a fatigue in general, and we do not know yet how to resolve it, although some of the ideas have, have already been raised, and I would just come back to them very, very, very briefly. Uh, but we have another challenge, and that was also, I think, uh, very, very, very eloquently discussed uh, uh, earlier this afternoon, and that was the uh, political, the party political structure. I enjoyed both presentations very much, I have to tell you. Uh, agreed with most of what uh, have been uh, uh, said. Uh, clearly, there is a fundamental restructuring of the uh, European political landscape. It is not limited to Europe. We all know uh, the story and follow it very intensively, what is now going on in the United States, and we, not, we do not know yet what will be the ultimate outcome, 
black swamps are not to be excluded in a way. But well, let's wait and see and follow what is going, what is going on. But what, coming back to Europe, clearly there is a progressive meltdown of, of the middle, middle left, middle right, whatever. It's not meltdown, maybe it's too much to say. But uh, if you look at the uh, result of the Austrian presidential uh, uh, elections, then it's, it's still, I mean, surprising or amazing, 11% for each mainstream parties. So, and it's not limited to, uh, to Austria. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the wings are moving, uh, just in soccer sometimes. Uh, on the wings, uh, people move much faster than in the middle, and that is the problem. Uh, coming back to this uh, famous question, the definition of populism. Uh, I always have had some suspicions about this word, but I, I understand that populism as a word has become very popular. Uh, you can say popular, of course, that populist might create problems. And there are def definitions. I, By the way, I, I agree more or less with, with David. I don't know if he's here still or not. Definition. But I have my own definition. And uh, of course, uh, that, that is the best possible definition, my own. And this is very simple. Populist is my political opponent, because I'm a Democrat. And for my political opponent, maybe I'm a populist, but I mean, I'm just trying to, uh, to express a little bit jokingly that we use this now for anyone. Uh, I mean, who is a little bit out of, uh, of um, well, mainstream thinking or political correctness, he must be somebody suspicious. And what, what, what word can I, can I use? I mean, he's a populist. Now, I'm happy because we use this word not only for the right, but also for the left, and that's okay. And we all know that there is very, very many common elements between the two wings. And my question is very simple. What happens with the political, the party political structure uh, uh, in Europe if, uh, if, if the two, let's say, wings of populists uh, uh, come closer to one another and maybe make an alliance. Maybe they might govern together. Unheard of. No, I'm sorry. Please cross the border. Go over to Burgenland. And then you will find a coalition. Of course, this is not a good example because the left is not the extreme. It's just the left. But the left is now governing uh, Burgenland together with the radical right. So what then? Huh? It happens. By the way, there are other examples as well, north, west, where there is, of course, a tacit or, or not that much implied, even explicit uh, cooperation uh, between, uh, between the left and the, and the radical right. So uh, this is something which we, I believe, have to pay, pay particular attention. But that's a long subject, so I would stop here. Uh, number five, uh, internal basically internal challenge that also has been discussed uh, uh, at length uh, uh, all through the day. This is the internal division uh, of, uh, of European Union. I'm not speaking about the uh, north uh, and uh, the south, although that exists as well. I'm not speaking about the transfer union versus uh, 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 transfer uh, union uh, versus any, anything else, fiscal union, which is of course something different, but anyway. Uh, what I'm speaking about is the uh, division between uh, the West and the East. Uh, and uh, it started, I would say, well before the migration, and that I want to underline. It started years ago. Uh, books were published. One of them was published by, by a very good friend uh, who used to be a French uh, uh, minister for Europe. And uh, the main conclusion of his book is that uh, the original sin was committed by the so-called Eastern enlargement. Had it not been uh, this Eastern enlargement, 
the European integration would not have any serious problems. And this is widespread. Another French minister, present minister, he proposes to restart the whole exercise. Many other people, even well-known Europeans, they now make some references to a possibility of uh, not just refondé, because refondé would be fine, but they suggest a kind of, uh, uh, well, restarting afresh the whole exercise. They sometimes even refer to the number of countries that could be included in this new exercise, seven, eight, ten, maybe founding members, maybe a little bit more. Uh, it's not, 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 not identified uh, precisely. Uh, by the way, the Eastern guys, uh, the barbarians, they never opposed to the uh, development of European construction. They were not the ones who uh, voted against uh, the constitutional treaty. Of course, fortunately, the UK did not have such a referendum at that time. Uh, but founding members opposed the constitutional treaty. And then later on, Slovak taxpayers had to contribute maybe not immediately, but they had to contribute to the bailout package for Greece. And I'm not thinking that the Greek problem was a problem of democracy. I think it was a question of spending other people's money and to give it back or not. But that's another story. What I want to say is that uh, we can, of course, start the blame game. We can start this scapegoating. Uh, we, can, we can say that, uh, of course, without these new guys, everything would be much better. But this is something utterly untrue. And, of course, jeopardizes uh, the whole exercise. By the way, if uh, a new venture uh, was started, with whom, please? Germany and France, with the diametrically opposing economic philosophies, which are unrelated to the political family governing, because it, they would exist even without that. We all know that. Or do we want to do it with the Dutch, who uh, have a referendum on the Ukrainian association agreement? Or maybe they have a referendum on, on, on the transatlantic uh, uh, free trade agreement, if ever. Uh, or the Belgians with the ratification of five parliaments. I'm not going to, uh, to, to, to the Norse, the Scandinavians, or even Iberians, you know that. Well, or Austria, maybe. Austria was identified as a possible additional member for the founding members. Maybe, maybe, but before ask them. That's also a, an important question of, of democracy. So, uh, solutions, suggestions. Um, first, I already said, stop the blame game, stop the scapegoating, uh, sub this so-called, uh, I'm the good guy, you are the bad guy, this kind of moral superiority, which is now coming from different directions, what the English call, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the virtue signaling, uh, that should be stopped, because there is a backfire, and people feel insulted, and that, I believe, should be, should be uh, avoided, because we are not emotional at all, we are reasonable. Hopefully, the British will also be reasonable. Uh, but my first suggestion is, and it's not my own suggestion, a good book was published uh, not uh, so much time ago. It was written by, uh, by a French socialist this time, Hubert Vedrin, good friend. And he proposed a pose. By the way, we have been proposing a pose for a long time. This bicycle example should be forgotten. Or, okay, if you want to stick to the bicycle example, then just put the bicycle aside. Don't move it. Don't move it. It's enough. Don't uh, 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 widen the gap between the public opinion, the, the feelings of the people, uh, and the elite. Well, it's commonplace, so I don't want to uh, 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 dwell on that uh, too long. But this is a key issue that, uh, uh, that we shouldn't shouldn't, shouldn't deepen uh, the ditch, uh, and the, the best way of, of doing that is uh, uh, to, to, to make a pause, uh, to, to, to look, look around, uh, and uh, to think, 
as it has been just done by, by Professor Eshpada, to think what, what, what we should do. Uh, we should also forget about the clash of concepts, great concepts, clash of ideologies. It leads nowhere. We should try to find solutions, practical solutions. And that is what is called flexibility. Flexibility in every sense. Uh, pragmatism. I attended a conference, let's say, a week ago. All European lawyers had a congress here in Budapest. It's a very important congress with the participation of most of the European judges and so on. And that was quite clearly explained. Uh, that we don't want to build any longer a single European legal order. We fully recognize subsidiarity. I would accept that uh, maybe uh, uh, lots of lip service has been paid to this and we should deepen it much more, correct? But uh, we also uh, uh, reconfirmed the principle of conferral of competencies in the Lisbon uh, Treaty as well. So uh, I'm not sure that in this regard nothing has been done because now the situation is quite clear, more clear uh, than it used to be before. An additional element is that this is, of course, also included in the uh, presumed uh, uh, agreement with the United uh, Kingdom. It only comes into force, as we know, if uh, uh, UK remains. Uh, also, uh, there is an interesting uh, uh, qualification regarding the ever closer uh, union. Uh, and even more important for countries, for instance, like mine, uh, is, uh, is uh, the uh, reference, the pre-reference in the Lisbon uh, Treaty to the national identity. And in this case, national identity for us means the member states' identity, the member states' constitutional identity. That's the key word. And uh, uh, these are all steps in the direction of a more flexible, more tolerant, uh, much, much less federative Europe, because we have to understand. I understand it. I used to be a fanatic federalist when we were outside of the whole world. Of course, in, in, in Budapest, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, you were a federalist, because you wanted to get into this, and you had your dreams. Now, of course, we are a little bit more reasonable, and we realize that, okay, stop it, but, but continue it. After a careful thinking about everything, and my my, my, my last uh, important point, I mean, last but one. I mentioned already this morning the external role. Uh, and of course, uh, there was a, a reference to that uh, when I was uh, 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 suggesting that uh, stronger uh, defense capabilities should be developed. I didn't mean it against or outside of NATO. I was speaking about defense capabilities of EU member states of EU, if you want to put it that way, but this would not be outside of or against NATO. But it's ridiculous what we have now, EU member states, except, of course, for the UK, maybe to some extent France. But the key issue is that we have to contribute to our own security much more, and we all know that. Poles know it very well. They are not only knowing it, they're doing it. So, should, the others should follow. Uh, <clears throat> and I also accept, just referring back to another remark, that maybe uh, Margaret Thatcher in those years were not a great supporter of single market. But I can only speak about my own personal experiences. Uh, four years long, the British foreign minister and the British minister for Europe, he always advocated the deepening of the single market. It was a recurring subject. And I, in most cases, I agreed with him. And that's why I voiced my agreement also this morning. So, <clears throat> last point, which is perhaps the most important one. Uh, it's, um, it's European soft power. That's where we could and should be the most powerful. And we don't use that. Why? Because of the vacuum effect, which I was referring to. Hubert Bedrin, the socialist French minister, he now recognizes that it was a mistake not to make a reference to Christian or Judeo-Christian values in the constitutional treaty. It is a socialist French minister who recognizes it. And he said, it is a heritage issue. 
It is an identity issue. Uh, it's not a program, of course, it, there is no such program, but the, it is a heritage issue, which we have to accept, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and we, uh, we have to, to recognize. Uh, but that's heart of the problem, that unless we can, we can develop uh, 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 an identity, we, 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 we have no solution. Of course, references were made uh, to, the, to the demos, absence of demos. F allegiance or attachment or affiliation. Uh, yes, that is identity. A couple of years ago, uh, in some uh, European member states, the word uh, identitaire or communautaire, it was not permitted to be used. It was Schimpfwort. Now you can use it, because we realize that, yes, there are such things as identities. And of course, uh, identities, because for an individual uh, there is no such thing as a singular identity. Uh, because we belong to different uh, groups, so we have several uh, individual identities uh, that attaches us to different communities. We have first and foremost national identity. We should try not to deny it. And we should recognize that this is the strongest identity in Europe. Because it comes from, from back in the past. It formed us. That's why we are what we are. Remember who you are and what you represent. This is the famous uh, uh, song. So uh, national identity first. But that does not exclude a European identity. Uh, there are interesting, very interesting opinion polls on European identity. And you realize that, yes, most of European citizens accept as a second identity the European identity. I might even add, but that's very subjective, a central European identity, but don't get into that uh, too far. Uh, I think that, um, yes, we know that uh, we are in crisis. We know that many things will have to be changed, and uh, hopefully they will be changed. Uh, I am less optimistic in the short run. I'm a little bit more optimistic in the, in the longer uh, run. So, um, and I also would like to finish with a confess confession, very simple. Uh, I'm one of those who, who like Europe who even like European Union, despite all the deficiencies and flaws. Uh, so try to save it. And uh, please stay together.